Burkina Faso is a nation rising from chaos. A young military captain has seized control and is making waves across Africa. Ibrahim Traore took power in a violent coup last September. Since then, he's been shaking up the old order and making enemies of powerful nations. Traore has no fear of the mighty. He's taken on the economic bloc Ecowas, threatening war against them. Nigeria and Ghana, two regional heavyweights, are also in his crosshairs. Why is this 34-year-old army captain risking so much? What does he want to achieve by defying everyone? In this explosive video, you'll discover the motivations driving Treor's brazen actions. You'll see how he's rallying support by standing up to Western powers. And you'll understand the high-stakes game of brinksmanship he's playing that could ignite all-out conflict in West Africa. This whole fiasco kicked off when Ghana's president, Nana Akufo Addo, made some bombshell accusations against Burkina Faso. On March 12, 2024, at the US African Leader Summit, Akufo Addo stepped up and claimed that Burkina Faso's military government had allied with Russian mercenaries. Not just any mercenaries, but the notorious Wagner Group. According to Akufo Addo, Burkina Faso had hired these Russian fighters to help battle insurgents within their borders. But he didn't stop there. Akufo Addo took it a step further, alleging that in exchange for the mercenaries' services, Burkina Faso had given away part of their southern territory to Russia. And these were some heavy-hitting claims to make on such a major international stage. Accusing another nation of handing over land to a foreign power like Russia is about as serious as it gets in diplomatic circles. Akufo Addo's words immediately ignited a raging diplomatic crisis between Ghana and Burkina Faso. The allegations were like throwing a match on a pile of dry kindling. They sparked widespread concern and speculation among nations worldwide and global organizations like the United Nations. Many voiced interest in the matter, calling for a thorough, impartial investigation to uncover the real truth behind Akufo Addo's explosive accusations against Burkina Faso. Akufo Addo didn't just make these claims out of thin air. He claimed to have evidence supporting his allegations of a Burkina Faso-Russia mercenary alliance. While the specific details haven't been made public yet, the president hinted at intelligence reports and testimonies suggesting links between Burkina Faso's military and the Wagner Group fighters. Today, Russian mercenaries are on our northern border. Burkina Faso has now entered into an arrangement uh, to go along with Mali in employing the Wagner forces there. I believe a mine in southern Burkina has been allocated to them as a form of payment for their services. Prime Minister of Burkina Faso in the last 10 days has been in Moscow. And to have them operating on our northern border is particularly distressing for us in Ghana. Apart from not uh, uh, accepting the idea of the great powers uh, once again making Africa the theater of operation, we have a particular position that you know about over the Ukraine war, where we have been very, very vocal and upfront about condemning the invasion of Russia, by Russia. And therefore, they're now to have this group in our borders is a matter of some considerable disquiet and concern for us. However, critics have been quick to question the credibility and solid foundation of whatever evidence Akufo Addo is claiming to have. The international community is anxiously awaiting further clarification and a more detailed presentation of this supposed proof to assess its validity and relevance to the accusations. As the world waited with bated breath, Burkina Faso's military leader, Ibrahim Traore, wasted no time firing back at Akufo Addo's explosive allegations. In a recent interview, Traore came out swinging, vehemently denying any alliance between his country and Russian mercenaries from the Wagner Group. 
Traor didn't mince words. He called Akufa Addo's claims completely baseless and lacking any factual evidence whatsoever. The military strongman questioned the very credibility of whatever proof Ghana claims to have, dismissing the entire situation as outright false from top to bottom. It's abundantly clear that Traor takes immense pride in defending Burkina Faso's reputation on the world stage at all costs. His forceful, unwavering response shows he has zero tolerance for these kinds of damaging accusations aimed at portraying his nation as unfit. Traor seems dead set on safeguarding Burkina Faso's image against what he believes are bogus claims fueled by ulterior motives. The fiery back and forth between the two neighboring West African nations has tensions at a boiling point. The heated exchange and flurry of denials from Traor have added yet another layer of complexity to an already convoluted situation. The conspiracy theories are running wild, further heightening the mystery surrounding the explosive issue. As Traor and Akufo Addo trade verbal grenades, the international community is watching the rapidly evolving crisis like a hawk. Nations and global organizations worldwide have voiced alarm over the allegations of Russian mercenary involvement. They are urging a full, fair and impartial investigation be conducted to finally uncover the truth behind Ghana's inflammatory claims against Burkina Faso. But Traor's vehement denials have muddied the waters even further. If he's telling the truth, it begs the question. What evidence could Ghana possibly have to level such serious accusations? What rock-solid proof implicates Burkina Faso's military in clandestine operations with Russian mercenaries? The explosive allegations from Ghana's president sent shockwaves throughout the international community. As news of Akufo Addo's claims against Burkina Faso spread like wildfire, it sparked widespread concern and rampant speculation among nations around the globe. Superpower countries and smaller nations alike watch the situation with hawkish eyes. Global organizations like the United Nations and the African Union expressed grave interest in the escalating diplomatic crisis. Officials and pundits everywhere weighed in, dissecting every new development. There was one prevailing sentiment, calls for an immediate, thorough and impartial investigation to finally uncover the truth behind Ghana's inflammatory accusations. The international community refused to take Akufo Addo's claims about Russian mercenaries at face value without solid evidence. Neighboring African countries were particularly shaken. Some showed solidarity with Ghana, echoing the importance of investigating any potential external interference in internal state affairs to preserve regional stability. But others adopted a more cautious stance, withholding judgment and advocating for a diplomatic resolution through dialogue. Complex alliances and blocs like the African Union splintered the response. The various considerations of stability, diplomatic ties, and national interests guided each country's reaction. But the urgency for a definitive fact-finding mission into the matter rang out loud and clear across the continent. As accusations of Russian mercenary involvement in Burkina Faso made global headlines, the Kremlin found itself squarely in the diplomatic crosshairs. Moscow could no longer stay silent on such serious allegations from Ghana's president. Russia vehemently denied any role in the situation, distancing itself from Akufo Addo's claims in the strongest terms possible. In an official statement, the Russian government expressed surprise and disappointment, dismissing the entire narrative as baseless and lacking any credible foundation. The Kremlin pulled no punches, emphatically rejecting the idea that Russian mercenaries were contracted by Burkina Faso's military. They categorically denied the damning accusation that the Wagner Group had any presence whatsoever in the West African nation, calling it ludicrous propaganda. However, Russia didn't just stop at denying the allegations. They too advocated for a full, fair 
and impartial investigation to be conducted. But Moscow had an added condition. They emphasized the critical importance of relying only on verified concrete evidence before drawing any conclusions. Russia's stance mirrored Burkina Faso's. Both nations demanded if such earth-shattering claims were to be made, they must be backed by undeniable proof, not hearsay or flimsy circumstantial evidence. Otherwise, the allegations amounted to baseless smears damaging to international diplomacy. The Kremlin carefully walked a tightrope. They forcefully denied any nefarious activities without leaving room for compromise. But they also stressed the door remained open to transparent fact-finding, provided Ghana produced credible evidence to substantiate Akufo Addo's inflammatory accusations. With so many competing narratives, the situation rapidly descended into a diplomatic quagmire. The clash between Accra and Ouagadougou over potential Russian interference had quickly engulfed the entire world, exacerbating already tenuous geopolitical tensions between rival camps. The fiery diplomatic clash between Ghana and Burkina Faso didn't stay contained for long. Like a stone tossed into a still pond, the shocking allegations rippled outward, impacting Burkina Faso's relationships with other African nations near and far. Some neighboring countries rallied behind Ghana, expressing grave concern over the potential of Russian mercenary forces operating in the region. They agreed with Akufo Addo. Any hint of external military interference in a sovereign nation's affairs must be thoroughly investigated to preserve stability. However, others adopted a more cautious, wait-and-see approach. These nations urged all sides to show restraint and called for a peaceful diplomatic resolution through dialogue and credible fact-finding missions. They refused to take Ghana's claims about Russia at face value without vetted evidence. The reactions highlighted the complex web of regional alliances and national interests at play. Established blocs like the African Union found themselves internally divided over the matter. Each member nation carefully weighed the ramifications through the lens of their domestic priorities. For nations bordering Burkina Faso directly, the allegations took on heightened urgency. They worried the potential Russian mercenary presence could destabilize the entire region by exacerbating pre-existing conflicts and security vacuums. Diplomatic ties with Ouagadougou immediately strained as a result. But the nations farther afield took a more pragmatic tact. While they demanded answers to the allegations, they refused to sever relations outright with Burkina Faso until investigations revealed undeniable proof of Kremlin malfeasance. For them, preserving trade, security cooperation, and economic interdependence with the embattled nation took precedence for now. The mixed global and regional response underscored the gravity of the situation. Ghana's president had lobbed a diplomatic grenade, surely, but its shockwaves hadn't yet reached their full destructive potential. Whether the fissures between African nations would soon give way to open conflict hinged on the unraveling truth. While Ghana's allegations against Burkina Faso triggered an international firestorm, they also stoked red-hot political divisions at home. Akufo Addo's bombshell claims about Russian mercenaries polarized the Ghanaian political landscape like never before. The president's supporters rallied behind his bold denunciation of Burkina Faso. They commended Akufo Addo for taking a hard line in the interest of national security against any potential foreign meddling by Russia in the region's affairs. His base praised the willingness to call out the alleged misdeeds on the global stage. However, Akufo Addo's critics pounced on the allegations as a blatant political ploy to score points and shift focus from domestic troubles. They demanded the president reveal concrete proof, rather than run a disinformation campaign against Ouagadougou based on flimsy intelligence. Opposition figures accused the administration of manufacturing 
an external crisis to mask internal policy failures. They questioned the underlying motives behind choosing Burkina Faso as the scapegoat amid strained ties between the neighboring nations. The heated debates raged across all levels of Ghanaian society and political institutions. Social media became an unmoderated battlefield where insults and disinformation rapidly spread. In the streets, pro-government and opposition protesters frequently clashed. At the heart of the discord, increasing polarization over whether the president purposefully fabricated the Russian mercenary claims or rightfully raised a legitimate national security red flag based on credible evidence. With no definitive proof revealed yet, both sides peddled their narratives relentlessly to the public. The domestic turmoil posed an existential challenge for Akufo Addo's administration. Losing control of the narrative could completely derail his agenda and set the stage for civil unrest. But doubling down without offering substantive proof continued eroding trust in his leadership and Ghanaian institutions. Ultimately, only a thorough, impartial investigation could settle the raging debate and begin mending the deepening political schisms, tearing apart the social fabric. But the longer Ghana refused to present its evidence, the more rabid the skeptics grew at home and abroad. The nation found itself at an impasse, unable to move forward until the truth finally emerged from the shadows. As tensions simmered between Burkina Faso, Ghana and their allies, Ibrahim Traore didn't mince words. The tough-talking military leader launched a blistering attack against Nigeria and ECOWAS, the regional bloc currently headed by Nigerian President Bola Tinubu. In a fiery address to thousands of citizens, Traor accused ECOWAS of being directly responsible for the deaths of countless innocent Nigerians. His scathing remarks specifically called out the harsh economic sanctions imposed on neighboring Niger by the Tinubu-led organization. Traor lambasted ECOWAS for these draconian sanctions that crippled Niger's infrastructure and supply lines. He claimed the loss of electricity and medicine for hospitals led to needless fatalities, a crime that ECOWAS must answer for. But Traor didn't just condemn. He issued a stern warning backed by thinly veiled threats of military force. The defiant leader highlighted the strength, combat experience and resilience of Niger's battle-hardened army. In a show of solidarity with the Nigerian military junta, Traor stated the armies of the Sahel region stand united and ready to take on the ECOWAS forces supposedly on standby for intervention. His ominous words, we are waiting for that standby force. Traor's saber-rattling rhetoric significantly raised the stakes in the explosive regional crisis. His willingness to escalate to armed conflict over the ECOWAS sanctions signaled Burkina Faso was digging in for a protracted struggle against Nigeria, Ghana, and their Western allied backers. Traor's diatribe against ECOWAS extended far beyond just Nigerian President Tinubu. The Burkinabe leader condemned the entire organization for its inept, tone-deaf handling of the people's suffering under the economic blockade. He accused ECOWAS of neglecting international laws and flagrantly violating key agreements in its zealous efforts to punish Niger's military government through crippling sanctions. Specific actions like the closure of seaports to the landlocked nation drew Traor's fury. Despite the humanitarian crisis unfolding, Traor berated ECOWAS for its ineffective, lackadaisical response as people's lives hung in the balance. He contrasted the callous negligence of ECOWAS with Niger's resilience, praising its pivot towards self-sustaining energy solutions like solar and nuclear power to subvert malicious supply cuts. But Traor's criticism extended far beyond just ECOWAS. In a sweeping rebuke, he condemned a whole generation of useless and incompetent African leaders 
who failed to prioritize the basic welfare of their suffering citizens. As an example, he called out Ivorian President Alassane Ouattara directly for spitefully cutting electricity exports to Mali in 2022, which only ended up hurting Ouattara's people through higher costs. For Traor, it perfectly exemplified how some leaders lash out against their neighbors at the expense of their most vulnerable. To truly underscore how African leaders had lost their moral compass, Traor drew a stark comparison to the ongoing conflict between Russia and Ukraine. Despite their heated warfare, he noted how Vladimir Putin still refused to cut off energy supplies that could endanger Ukrainian civilians. In contrast, Traor accused Nigerian President Tinubu of callously depriving his people of access to electricity, food and medicine due to the ECOWAS blockade on neighboring Niger. For the people living near the Niger border, Tinubu's sanctions represented a death sentence, Traor raged. The military strongman left no doubt. Tinubu and other African leaders had blood on their hands for the untold thousands perishing in hospitals due to their petty geopolitical squabbles. They prioritized stamping out Niger's junta over the basic human rights of their citizens. While Russia's invasion drew global condemnation, Traor argued the African leadership's treatment of its people deserved equally strident outrage. Yet beyond some tepid calls for dialogue, the international community remained silent about the deteriorating humanitarian crisis caused by ECOWAS. For Traor, this deafening silence simply underscored how African lives were seen as expendable by the West and its local subordinates like Tinubu. As self-interest reigned, core principles like the responsibility to protect took a back seat. In the face of ECOWAS's hardline sanctions and the lack of international outcry, Mali, Burkina Faso and Niger determined the only path forward was banding together. The three nations, governed by juntas, announced their exit from ECOWAS to form a new regional confederation, the Alliance of Sahel States, AES. The goal? Establishing an alternative governance structure free from overt Western influence and meddling. No longer would external powers exploit the region's internal affairs and security vacuums through proxies like ECOWAS. The AES audaciously proclaimed its intent to become self-sustaining and impervious to outside economic arm-twisting. Plans were unveiled to aggressively develop renewable energy sources like solar, as well as pursue nuclear power, to permanently unshackle from the West's energy stranglehold. For Traor and the other SAR leaders, forming the AES represented more than just self-preservation in the face of ECOWES's aggression. It was an ideological statement. Africa's interests would no longer be subjugated by Cold War games of proxy brinksmanship between world powers. Instead, the AES aimed to usher in a new era of true Pan-African solidarity and integration based on shared prosperity, development and security. As the Confederation solidified, the firebrand Traor promised it would grow into an undeniable counterweight to ECOWAS's waning clout and foreign meddling. Ibrahim Traor's stern warning to Nigeria and Ghana should not be taken lightly. His willingness to escalate rhetoric and potentially use military force to counter ECOWAS aggression raises the specter of protracted regional instability. The fiery Burkinabi leader channeled simmering anti-Western, anti-imperialist sentiments coursing through parts of Africa. His blistering condemnations of both ECOWAS and African leaders he deems Western puppets tapped into a deep well of grievances over perceived neo-colonial meddling. Should Traor and the emerging AES Alliance of Sahel nations make good on promises to definitively sever remaining threads of external influence, it could dramatically upend regional power dynamics. No longer would ECOWIS and its Western backers enjoy unchecked economic and diplomatic primacy. The spectre of a recalcitrant, self-sustaining AES 
actively competing against ECOWES, the hearts and minds across West Africa raises new uncertainties. Would other nations gravitate towards the AES's vision of an integrated Africa free from foreign interference? Or would the traditional Western-aligned blocs successfully isolate the upstart alliance? Regardless, Treor's explosive entrance onto the global stage injected new ideological fervor into long-simmering debates over Africa's path forward. The ascendant populists, patriotism he champions, challenges long-held Western precepts and risks dividing the continent further along progressively hardening camps. For the international community consumed by the Russia-Ukraine conflict, Treor's stern warning and formation of the AES demands sustained attention and deft diplomacy. Miscalculations that inflame tensions could upend wider strategic calculations. One thing is clear, the old status quo centered on ECOAS is crumbling rapidly, and unpredictable new alliances are rushing to fill the void. What did you think of Treor's fiery rhetoric and the formation of the AES alliance? Will it upend the regional order or fizzle out? Leave a comment below with your perspective. Don't forget to like this video, subscribe, and hit the notification bell for more hard-hitting examinations of global affairs.